from Wonderland Elementary, this is Art News with Edna Egelhofer. Good evening and welcome to Art News. I'm Edna Egelhofer. Today we will be interviewing a contemporary artist who uses geometric shapes to create simple cartoon-like figures that seem simple at first but reveal the complexities of the human condition. This artist's name is Layla Ali. Now, Layla Ali grew up in Buffalo, New York, and she now lives and works in Williamstown, Massachusetts. She's well known for her paintings on paper that involve strange beings of indeterminate age, gender, race, and meaning. Layla, welcome to Art News. Your art is very flat, cartoon-like in style. What was your main inspiration for this style? I spent a lot of time watching television. I think for artists of my generation, it has to be some kind of influence. I watched a lot of cartoons. It wasn't unusual for things to be two-dimensional. So when I use what looks to be sort of cartoon imagery in my work, it's just part of what I grew up with. Your art is inspired by cartoons, but how are they different from the fantastical cartoons found on TV or in comic books? When I talk about the work, I don't want to talk about it as if I believe in this alternative fantasy world, which is my secret little world, like a dollhouse, right? It doesn't really work that way for me. It's not a escapist fantasy. I wish it was, it would be much more pleasant and much more of a relief to be in here. It's a little bit too connected to the world, to my own life, for it to be an escapist um, endeavor. The figures in your work are drawn to be very simple, almost reduced to only the most essential parts. Why did you choose to make these figures very simplified? The figures don't have ears, <laughs> not yet. Um, they don't have to have eyebrows. I mean, there's things that they just don't have, and they still exist just fine as, I don't like to say creatures, because creatures starts to be almost too mm, monstrous. And I don't think of them as being fantastical. Well, by removing arms, in some ways, I can understand what they do a little bit more. So um, to figure out what can be done without arms, what kind of commands can be given, without arms, just through other kinds of gestures. There's still a lot of power left in the body, and in some ways I'm trying to see how much I can take out and still retain a really powerful or influential core or one that can tell a story. Instead of painting on large canvases, your work is typically painted on paper. Why choose to paint on paper instead of canvas? I was a real reader, and I think in that way, this, the way I work, is more like reading, um, you know, or writing, that I use paper instead of canvas. I'm very connected to the paper. And I think that has something to do with my love of reading and writing and the smallness of the images. I think also initially this idea that you could be intimately involved like you are in a book. Before you commit to starting a painting, do you have any preliminary sketches that you do beforehand? If so, what are they like? These are some of the drawings I've done, preliminary drawings. Part of my process is to do things to loosen up and come up with ideas. These are mostly helpful in terms of the costuming, so little details about headdresses and shapes and textures might appear in the paintings. Obviously, the paintings will be color, on these, a little bit of this expression could show up, but there'll be hopefully more complexity in the psychology of the facial expressions. I'm acting on impulse in the drawings, uh, and I think that's important. It's important to keep that part of really alive. So there are no paintings without the drawings, but they're very different from each other. Sometimes it looks like two different people have done them. Because they're not so studied, they can capture something I didn't anticipate. And they're more playful than the paintings, and they're more enjoyable to make. 
<laughs> frankly, yeah. The figures in your work all have different and somewhat unique colors for their skin tones. What effect do you think that these different colors have on the viewer's perception of the character? The green-headed figures all had the same color head and same color skin. These new characters have a wider range of facial coloring. I mean, I'm just sort of fascinated how just those visual phenomena affect your reading of the figure. What a color does, you know, how it affects your eyeball. Sometimes I wonder, is that what it is about? I mean, you know, dark-skinned people, you just, their face absorbs more light, so you have to look into them more, <laughs> they're more mysterious. I mean, what is it, you know? Could, could racism be just attributed to bizarre visual phenomena, you know? There's a question. Recently, you and choreographer Dean Moss have collaborated, collaborated to make a dance performance based on the figures in your drawings. How has working with dancers been different for you? Working with dancers and a performance piece. It is still foreign enough that when I walk in and there's actual living, breathing bodies there with hearts beating, <laughs> it's a little freaky. It's a little like, ah, ah, they're all alive. How do you deal with alive people? Choreographer Mr. Dean Moss is here to talk about this collaboration. Hello, Mr. Moss. Welcome to Art News. Can you talk about what interested you in Leila Ali's work that inspired you to want to create a dance performance? The first time I saw Leila's work, I was just struck by these images. And the seed for that idea of working together started to happen. I set about making some work in relationship to a set of images. She comes to rehearsal, looks at them, makes many, many, many notes. I'm totally sure of that one. I had a couple notes for you. I notice it because the paintings are frozen in time, right? So the expression I give them, that's it. It's forever. But for you to be burdened with that as a human being it's, doesn't seem it's right. Too much. You know what I mean? She's very precise. I had a kind of list of things that I wanted to occur over the course of this work. So I started cutting out Layla's um, books that she made for MoMA. These images would hold me to a kind of outline because the images themselves were iconographic. It is a score, but it doesn't tell me what to do. Layla Ali, there's a part in the performance that is based on one of your paintings that depicts a cruel game of dodgeball. What is your interest in the game and how do you think it's related to bullying and unfair power dynamics in society? I've just always been fascinated by dodgeball. I mean, I don't know how long it's going to take to wake up to the fact that this is a cruel game where the weakest in the school get targeted. I mean, I think I do know that part of the control that I want over these has to do with a lack of control over things in my life, uh, especially when I was a kid. What's mysterious about it is for all the control that I can have over the paintings, the ones that are successful for me, when they are done and I look at them, something happens that I didn't expect to happen. And I don't mean like, ooh, what's that? What happened over there? It means that they are giving back a kind of energy or presence. It's as if they've taken on a personality of their own in the making. So much of the work is about me trying to control it, doing all I can to control it, and yet it still defies me. <laughs> so um, that struggle, yeah. I want to thank you, Leila Ali and Mr. Dean Moss, for coming on Art News. Very thought-provoking stuff. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. This is Edna Egelhofer. Good night. This has been another rendition of Art News with Edna Egelhofer. Good night.